John Hope Bryan. I'm a founder, chairman, and CEO of 40 different organizations, up from nothing. I'm an entrepreneur who literally created his own best life. I'm with Dove Barron today talking about your best life, creating your best life, living your best life, about getting the memo about the world, how the world never taught you how power, money, wealth, and success really works. It's what you don't know that you don't know that's killing you, but you think you know. There's nothing wrong with you other than you never got the memo. Be aware, stay tuned, and listen to Dove Barron. Congratulations. You are tuned into Dove Barron's Leadership and Loyalty Show, the number one podcast for Fortune 500 executives and those who are dedicated to creating a quantum leap in leadership. Your host, Dove Barron, is the founder of FullMontyLeadership.com. He's an executive mentor to leaders like you a contributing writer for Entrepreneur Magazine, CEO World, and he's been featured on CNN, Fox, CBS, and many other notable sites. Dov Barron is an international business speaker who was named by Inc. Magazine as one of the top 100 leadership speakers to hire. Now, over to Dov Barron. Welcome, dear friends, fans, and fellow aficionados of leadership excellence. Thank you for joining us on this episode of Dov Barron's Leadership and Loyalty Tips, for executives, part of the Full Monty interview series. I'm your host, Dove Barron, founder of Full Monty Leadership, and I'm here to assist you tapping into your deep greatness so that you can reach that next level of clarity, focus, purpose, profit in your business, your life, and your leadership impact. Today, we'll be taking an inside look at why, the dis- why there is a disappearing middle class and what we as leaders can do to make a difference. If you're a new listener, a new viewer, thank you for joining us. Strap yourself in. We're about to go full Monty. Remember, you can also find us on iTunes, Spotify, iHeartRadio, or wherever you tune into your podcasts. We also need your help in staying relevant, so please get yourself over to iTunes, rate, review, and subscribe to the show. Uh, when you do listen to the show, you can also go and come over to the Facebook page and join us there and you can chat about this show or any of our shows. Remember, you can also catch us on traditional radio across the United States every Monday and Thursday from Las Vegas to Philadelphia in nine separate FM stations and five AM stations. And you can also catch us on Roku TV with 100,000 subscribers on there. And we are grateful to Inc.com for making us the number one podcast to make you a better leader. And we're also grateful that we are the number one podcast globally for Fortune 500 listeners with a potential listenership of 2.5 to 4 million listeners for every single show. So thank you very much for that. And also remember, you can find us on Alexa and on Google Play. Simply say, play Dove Baron podcast. Thank you for sharing the show with everybody you know. All right, let's strip it down and dive right in. As a leader, whether you are a CEO, whether you're a C-suite leader, sales leader, entrepreneur, or leader in any capacity, you might know that business is highly competitive. But can you do good while doing well? Well, stay, stay tuned because we're about to find out. Our guest today is John Hope Bryant. He was named in 2016 as Innovator of the Year by the American Banker magazine. John Hope Bryant is an American entrepreneur, author, philanthropist, and prominent thought leader on financial inclusion and empowering the underserved. Is He is uh, illuminating the path towards liberation that is hiding in plain sight for the struggling middle class and the invisible class. He says that true power, comes, uh, true power in this world comes from economic independence. His message is simple and as this, the majority of people around the world who live in poverty just haven't gotten the memo or the money to free enterprise until now. So, ladies and gentlemen, please put your hands together and welcome John Hope Grant. <laughs> I, I, I feel better about myself already. To you. <laughs> Thank you for joining us, my man. It's good to have you here. Honored to be with you. Thank you, Doug. So, you know, what I was, one of the things I said right at the beginning was that there's clearly a disappearing middle class. And how can we as, I mean, first of all, do you see that being acknowledged? I mean, I know you've been an advisor to presidents on these, on these issues, three presidents, I believe, and you've been honored by five. How do, how do you see that leaders who seem to be moving further and further, not even into the 1%, but the 0.1%, how, 
and that disappearing middle class and, as you said, the invisible class. How do we as leaders wake other leaders up to this? Well, uh, first of all, you're hitting on the right topic, man, because the, the, the magic of any society, uh, we've talked about your experiences from Australia to Canada to, uh, you know, UK and other parts of Asia and my experiences in Africa and uh, Latin America and the Middle East and, of course, throughout America. Uh, and those things that uh, bond your and my experiences is when we found a society that had a stable middle class, mm -hmm. we, we found also a stable democracy. Right. You cannot have stable democracy. You cannot have freedom. You cannot have self-determination uh, without having a solid middle class. Uh, and and so the magic of America really was after World War II. Uh, and uh, with, frankly, the Marshall Plan that rebuilt countries that had bombed us, talking about mm -hmm. doing doing good. I mean, Germany and Japan had bombed us. And the narrow-minded view uh, might have been, screw them, forget about them. They jammed us up. So an eye for an eye is going to leave everybody blind. We stepped over mess and not in it. We rebuilt the countries that bombed us, recognizing it was the leaders and not the people in the countries. And now who are two, or two, two of our biggest allies in the world, if not Germany and Japan, who mm -hmm. also have cut in it growing middle classes. Yes. And so it's the, it's the middle class that do all the philanthropic giving, not the very rich. It's the middle class that do all the vol the volunteering uh, and, and and going and makes it giving most of their money at church. By the way, every Sunday, uh, right. it's the it's the middle class that has compassion for the poor and the least of these uh, children. And by the way, it's the middle class that's driving the U.S. economy. So seventy percent of the uh, of our GDP, according to the Federal Reserve. Is, uh, is you and me going and buying Starbucks coffee or whatever coffee company you go to is, is paying car notes, paying rent, buying this, uh, buying products, uh, books from you and me, uh, uh, going to conferences, seminars, playing, playing tickets. It's not, it's not complicated stuff. It's basic stuff, right? And so we're looking for love in all the wrong places as leaders. And we're not giving credit to the people who are actually driving the economy who are, by the way, also living from paycheck to paycheck. So we're 70 percent of our country is living from paycheck to paycheck. That, by the way, that's every this is this is every developed country in the world. Yep. The, the middle class is living from paycheck to paycheck. I know your audience is global. Uh, and uh, that same population is driving that economy uh, over 70 percent. That is completely universal. But but we've forgotten our storyline. We've mm -hmm. forgotten as leaders where all this came from. And we're. And, and, and so why is this a problem? Because the challenging middle class, middle class didn't just sort of come out of nowhere. It came out of jobs mm -hmm. and just comes out of mostly business because 92% of all jobs in America are business jobs, free enterprise jobs. 8% of jobs are government jobs. But even if you say I'm for government, where do the government jobs come from? Come from taxes. Where do taxes come from? <laughs> Comes from payroll tax, from people paying into it. Where, the, where those yeah. folks jobs where the jobs so it's a it's a circle that goes back to the free enterprise system e even if you want to distribute money like a socialist you got to first collect money like a capitalist where are these capitalists coming from are they big businesses no all the jobs are coming from small businesses startups entrepreneurs and shoot ups years three through year seven so guys like you and me and ladies who are starting businesses and who i don't know how many employees you've got but i've got a few hundred right mm -hmm. that's that's the whole ball game that's like it's like royalty uh, in whatever country you're in, because that's what's driving the middle class. Now here's, so now I'm going to really come to your core question. In the last decade, in the U.S., the largest economy in the world, almost $20 trillion, we've got more small business dying than small business giving birth. Right. That's a big problem. And so, and so all this is connected together. We just lost, I guess what I'm saying is we've forgotten who we are. And we've forgotten that every big business was once a small one. Goldman Sachs was a guy named Goldman and a guy named Sachs selling financial services door to door. Walmart was Sam Walton with a pickup truck, a storefront, and a high school education and a dream. Now it's the largest retailer in the world. Whatever big business we want to point to was once a small business and somebody's dream. But at the same time, the some would say it's the entrepreneurial spirit to to grow bigger and bigger and bigger but the problem is not certainly not growing bigger but the problem is forgetting the why? forgetting <laughs> the well not only the why but forgetting that there are other people trying i mean in this hyper competitive 
mentality that we can get into, we, we end up cutting off our nose to spite our face, as the old term goes, uh, because we, we end up, I mean, if you look at, I mean, here's an example, startups, right? Yep. Startups, wonderful, I love startups, fantastic thing. But what's every, start, what's every startup trying to do? They're trying to sell out to the Googles and the Amazons of the world so they can pocket a couple of hundred million. Well, what we're doing is we've created a startup society that's actually feeding monopolies. I mean, so it's a very interesting economic cycle that actually, in, in many ways, seems to be hamstringing that middle class growing up. Everybody's getting a dream faster, but they forget that it's a lot of these things are unicorns. They don't last. They're, 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 they're one in a, in a million. And then, yeah. then, then everybody's forgetting about the, the people in the middle class who you said are the living mouth, of, you know, paycheck to paycheck. You know, too much month at the end of your money. So, Dove, you've just t- touched on maybe knowingly, may un- maybe unknowingly. I know you're a high high frequency person, so maybe y- you you just open this door for me. But this is not an economic problem. This is a spiritual problem. Absolutely, <laughs> not yeah. a human being having a spiritual uh, experience. We're spiritual beings having a human experience. It's all totally energy. We're, we're all energy. And what kind of energy? So the founder of Coke, Costco once told me, we were on a session together, that it, that culture is not the most important thing in his business. It's the only thing in his business. I'd argue that culture is the only thing in your studio right now. Culture is the only thing in your Dove Baron International Enterprises. Culture is the only thing at Operation Hope or at Brian Group Ventures or at Promise Homes Company. Culture is the only thing in our on our block, in our family. Mm-hmm. Uh, our country, what kind of culture we're we creating. So if the culture is about getting paid, if the culture is about making money, mm-hmm. you know, singers used to sing about love and, and family and, and romance 20 years ago. That's what songs were about. Now, look at, look at the songs. Money, chains, uh, 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 cars, uh, you know, thing, we've thingified everything. Why does a, bas- a basketball player want to play basketball? It used to be well, he wants to prove his artistry is the best in the world. Now he wants a $100 million contract. Uh, football player, the same thing. Uh, hockey player, the same thing. When, when your goal becomes money, you're done. Mm-hmm. Quincy Jones is one of my mentors, and, and he's worth $300 million plus. He, because of him, we have Michael Jackson. Because of him, we have Oprah Winfrey. Because of him, we have Will Smith. The list goes on and on and on more Grammy nominations than anybody, uh, an icon living in the world, right? And he said that he, he's never written a song for money, ever. Right. He fell in love with the song, man. He fell in love with that song. He, what he says, he goes in the studio, he gets the best musicians, the best the best art forms, the best cameras, the best music, the best audio like you have, and then he, he gets to the piano, he cocks his head, he says, please leave the door open just a little bit, give room for God to walk in. I'm not being religious here. Uh, I'm not at all. I'm, I'm just saying, simply saying that it, that w- even with Quincy Jones, he, he still needs the magic, right? And he, he, yeah. it's energy. And, he, and he, when he knows a song, when he falls in love with the song. Have, have you fallen in love with some entrepreneurial creation? Have you fallen in love with making your community better? Have you fallen in love with creating something that changes the world? I mean, Steve Jobs was a brilliant uh, designer, not a brilliant uh, uh, engineer. He was a brilliant designer, he was a brilliant marketer, and he was in love with the, the artistry of creating something that, that and, and as a result of that, by the way, this is not a phone, this is an emotional device, right? This, mm-hmm. this type, people in the world, so the largest market cap company in the world, and they made their money because people fell in love with their product. Absolutely. So, you know, we can go on and on and on, but the best things, I, I, I remember great customer service, right? <laughs> because I know, I mean, why, why did I move to Atlanta? People are nice for no economic reason. I mean, right. it's very, that's why I moved from L.A. to Atlanta. I loved L.A. I grew up in L.A., but I feel like a transaction in Los Angeles. I feel like nobody really cares about me. And that little thing there matters, man. That matters, and that, that thing can make you money. Caring, I wrote a book on that called Love Leadership. Loving people can make, build wealth. So it's not about making money. It's about building wealth. But this is, the, this is the problem, John, is that I, I fully agree with you, and I... For me, it, I'm, I'm a spirit having a human experience. And by whatever terms one wants to 
brand that in a, in a faith base or non faith base. It doesn't matter to me. It's irrelevant. Right. But at the same time, we, as much as I'd sometimes like to ignore it, I live in, I live in a material driven world that yep. is driven by two things. It is driven by wealth and fame. There was a time when, when you know, cause I'm not 22 years old, but I can remember when people oh. wanted to, <laughs> just a little bit over that. Um, just a little bit. Um, You're making gray cool, brother. You're making gray cool. <laughs> smart so, <laughs> so, you know, there's the, there was a time when we wanted to find our, we wanted to find what was our passion, what was our work, what was our, you know, what were we pulled to? And, and, and now when we interview kids, uh, not just millennials who are now their oldest at 38 years old, but Gen Z who are now 18 years old at the eldest, yeah. um, they are saying, what do they want? They want to be wealthy and they want to be famous. Yeah. Well, wealth and fame are results not ends. And, and I think that even for our generation, we've gotten a lot of that washed on us, you know, because we think that we influence down, but we're also influenced up generationally. By the and, way, and I think there's a lot of that going on and we've lost track of those, that spiritual ground, uh, as, as you would call it, culture. So, so take a pause right now and think about 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue and you just answered your question. What, is, what are people seeing? They're seeing the perception of wealth and they're seeing, seeing the perception of fame in the, embodiment of, in the embodiment of the man who's been elected 45th president of the United States of America. They're not seeing public service. I'm not sure he even cares about it. They're not seeing care for your fellow human being. I'm not saying he doesn't care. I'm saying that's not the message they're hearing. They're not seeing kumbaya, we're all in this together. In fact, it's divide and conquer. They're not seeing whether you're Republican or Democrat, it's the get it done party. No, no, it's this is party's great and that party's for crap. They're not seeing white, black, red, brown, or yellow. It's all producing more green. They're saying, no, this group is taking advantage of that group. So, so what you're saying is not only philosophically correct, it's literally what's going on. And so what happened is we've reached this tipping point, right? Yes. And everybody knows, like when you have a disease or an ailment, you may not know what it is, but you know something's not right in your body, Right. And you know you need to do something and change the trajectory of your life, but this story may end really badly. And what I'm saying is that rainbows only follow storms. The reason I'm not depressed by what is going on in the world right now is nobody changes in good times, man. Why would you? Right? If you're having a good time and everything's great, you just have, want to keep having a good time. People only change in bad times. They only change when things are crappy, when there's friction and drama or and they, they know that things could be better or they don't want to leave this travesty for their children as a legacy. So rainbows only follow storms. You cannot have a rainbow without a storm first. We've been here before. The world's been here before. We've had these inflection points for 3,000 years in modern history. Uh, fame and wealth have been as, as old as Jesus and, 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 the, and the Hebrew Bible. Whatever religion you want to cite is as old, uh, whether, whether it's Hinduism, Judaism, uh, 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 Buddhism, uh, uh, Islam, J uh, Christianity. I don't know if I miss one. I think those are major religions. It's it's prevalent uh, everywhere. People who are trying to get theirs. And what happens is when 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 you've been hijacked by thug culture, and we've been and, and we've made dumb sexy, <laughs> the so the world has dumbed down and celebrated it. You end up with this craziness, and now you have young people coming to you who actually think that they're owed something. Mm -hmm. And, and so this story is not going to end well because you and I both know, Dove, only in the dictionary does the word work, success come before the word work. Mm -hmm. because alphabetical. Young people today want to end, end late, long lunch, leave early. I come and dress the way I want to. I do what I want to. I stay as long as I want to. And you're lucky to have me here. Okay, that may work for you for two or three or four years. Try that as a life choice and see what happens. So, so look, everybody's got to learn lessons their own way. I, I was homeless for six months of my life. So why am I not afraid of the world? Because I've been, I've been at the depth, man. I've been at the bottom. My credit score was was crappy. I almost filed for bankruptcy. I had no friends. I lost everything, but still I rise. And mm -hmm. look at me. So it's through the pain and the struggle and the sacrifice that I became my best self. And I'm still of becoming course. myself, right? So I think that that is is where America is going. We got to go down before we got uh, uh, be before we can go back up again. I think it's where the world is. It's about choices. We are being forced to make a choice. 
not about what we want or what we have or how much how much we're going to own, but who are we? Well, I think you know I, I've said from for a long time that that life is traveling up a down escalator. Mm. Get That's complacent, and you're already a, you're already a floor lower. The moment you get complacent, and, and it's on that hard hit at the bottom that you have to wake up. And some people just lay down and go to sleep there, and just you know, and they park a tent. And other people say, you know what, I'm going to climb again. And and you know, there are things that I'm optimistic about in this political situation because I you know one of I did a video about this and wrote an article about it and said. Here's why Donald Trump's a great president. And, and people were like, what? <laughs> because tell me a president who's unified women better. He, well, well, unified and, and women. And 100 million people who didn't vote, who didn't think their vote mattered. Suddenly will care. Now, now you're going to see a surge in voting and, and participation right. in the system of democracy like never before. So don't don't be angry at your your at your so-called adversary in fact I don't even believe they're an adversary dr King once said dr Martin Luther King jr once said that that every good play every good storyline needs a protagonist and an antagonist absolutely, absolutely. otherwise you know you need people to sleep okay exactly. it's, it's edge right so he said I'm gonna be the protagonist I'm gonna be about love and joy and 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 I'm gonna let Rever I'm gonna let Bull, share Bull Connor I'm gonna let this governor, I'm going to let these people be the antagonist, right? And let the world then have a clear choice of who they want to be and who they want to side to. Now, uh, I think the world's better because he's here. I know the world's better because he's here, right? But 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 what if we had not made that choice? What if we just mm -hmm. said, ah, slavery's cool, uh, back in Lincoln's day. Ah, oh, you know, uh, being a, having totalitarian government's cool. Ah, uh, you know, we don't need to lean into rebuilding Germany and Japan. After World War II, ah, uh, you know, we don't need to get involved with what's going on in Europe. That's not our problem. Ah, uh, we don't need to, to get involved with what's going on with Japan or, or, or whatever the crisis was, right? Well, the world, literally the world would be different and we wouldn't be leaders. And I'd argue we wouldn't be the largest economy in the world. We wouldn't have a GDP of $20 trillion. I believe that, it's, that it literally is connected. Let me give, make you one last point because uh, I, I want somebody listening or watching this dub to be cynical. I want them to not believe what I'm saying. I want them, then I'm going to drop the mic on this. We're the largest economy in the world. We're the only race, the only, only culture in the world, only a country with every race of people within our borders. The two largest economies in the U.S. are California and New York. The two most diverse places in the U.S. Mm -hmm. are California and New York. You can't make this up. City of Los Angeles, 12th to 17th largest economy in the world, depending on when you measure it. Larger than the country of Turkey. Larger than most countries, the city of LA. 180 different ethnic groups. So you don't business, you do business with people you reflect, respect, and understand. Yeah. I'm going to trade with, 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 my, with, with, with my friends in, in Nigeria because I know Nigerians. I'm going to trade with my friends in the UK because I, I know people in the UK. I'm going to trade with Canada because I now know you. <laughs> okay, but, but it's about relationships. Who are your and what are your relationships? Because we have a relationship with the world, America has an economy that is worldwide. You yeah. cannot integrate, you cannot segregate your heart and integrate your pocket. You cannot segregate your heart with racism, with 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 fear, with repression, and integrate your pocket. It doesn't work. Well, I think it does work, and it works, but it works short term, and that's what we're seeing. You want to and, and this is this is what's caused the the the. the the visceral response from people is because people are doing that. And this is why I want, I am very keen on waking up leaders to say, I think that we have to do good and, and do well. Um, we have lots of people on this, uh, on this show who are B Corp organizers. They, they're, they are about conscious capitalism and all those kinds of things. And I'm loving that there's a rise in that, um, yeah. you know, which is actually giving care to others. And one of the things that you speak about is uh, that I really like is you talk about financial dignity. And, yeah. I, and I think this is a very important thing because this is something I think we need to address, particularly in the context of moving forward as we, as we enter the time of more and more AI, because yeah. we're going to see more and more jobs disappearing. We had, uh, we had uh, Trump when he was, when he was running for election talking about keeping coal mines open. It's like, 
Listen, I grew up in the UK as a kid, and I saw the coal miners striking, and guess what? The coal mines are gone. You can, you can, you can slow down maybe a little progress, but you can't stop it. It's ridiculous and it's stupid, and what you have to do is retrain. But in, this, in the context of that, there is changes that are coming in the form of AI that are going to potentially move those bottom end jobs away, and there may be no financial dignity. Uh, well, uh, no and yes. You go far enough to the North Pole, you end up south. So if we're going to keep banging on the old economy's doors and banging on the door of fear and saying that I'm going to get mine by taking yours and it's about making money versus building wealth, it's about getting paid versus building a society, then you're absolutely right. If it's about reimagining our future, figuring out where we're going and figuring out how do we upgrade our software, then we say, you know, there's probably a multi-trillion dollar, I would argue, I'd argue a hundred trillion dollar economy in saving the environment. Exactly. Uh, let me give you an example. Uh, uh, I drove here on asphalt highways. That's so. That's so. Yesterday, I drove mm -hmm. here. And there, are, there are there are wood poles up, and there there are lights. There are are, are, are cables from wood pole to wood pole, like like it's in the 1800s or 1920, right? It's so old school. Uh, uh, I saw a light post with a red yellow, green lamp in front of me, right? Uh, that's so obstructionist to my field of view. Uh, in, my, in my opinion, though, uh, no different than the, the music business went from, uh, uh, went from uh, uh, vinyl records to uh, eight tracks to cassette tapes. And uh, sadly, sadly, we're old enough to remember that. Uh, that's right. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> some, people what some people younger who are listening don't know what we're talking about right now. But I had you, Earl Nightingale on LP. Wow! I still have look. I still have. I still have eight track. I still have eight track tapes in my office. This, I, I, this, this is not like freaking people out when they walk in. Like it's like. Yeah, it's, I, it's, I want you to install an eight track player in your Aston Martin. I, That's what know, I want because that would be the that would be the <laughs> ultimate cool. joke. I might do it for the cool factor alone. Exactly. Right? So 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 we you know wasn't that the record or music business. Uh, kept innovating new products and new songs and new music. Maybe they did, but that wasn't the thing that drove revenue. What drove revenue was a new delivery system. Yes. Uh, and they basically sold me my whole record catalog, me and all my friends. They took my old record catalog, repurposed it, and sold it to me all over again and made hundreds of billions of dollars, maybe, you know, every year. And that worked for 30, 40, almost 50 years. And then, of course, they made a mistake, tripped on the internet. And and digital and it didn't and unfortunately hadn't figured out uh, you know where this was going and now they end up with kids thinking that music is free. Uh, we we will we'll, we'll, we'll reimagine that, fix it. But my point is the the environment is no different. If if we're if you have uh, so if you have all these asphalt highways that are that are ubiquitous ubiquitous all around the world, let's put literally literally a billion people to work. This is not to, this, this is not fanciful. Uh, creating solar Highways. The technology exists. Solar nice. highways put the put uh, uh, and this works really in places that's hot, which by the way tend to be poor, like the Middle East and Africa. Put the uh, solar panels on the highways. Replace the, the, the that asphalt, which is increasing CO2 levels, increasing the heat levels of this planet, right? And and then plug in your, your the residences that are next to those highways to a grid. Mm -hmm. That then powers their homes and then take the excess energy, power, and sell it to places that are cold that tend to be, by the way, wealthier. Mm -hmm. uh, and now you create a global economy, a global uh, fair trade. Uh, you've got the poor, so-called poor, selling to the very rich. And you created a whole new generation, maybe two, of jobs in a multi, multi-trillion dollar economy. But nobody's even thinking this way because we're locked in fear. We're surviving, not we have a surviving mentality, not a thriving mentality. We're convinced about we're focused on what we're against, not what we're for. Right. Yeah, Nobody absolutely. It created a nonprofit social investment bank until I created it. You know, right. no one created. No one thought that Apple was even relevant until Steve Jobs created it. Now, people can't. Everybody's using a, a version of a this touch screen. Every company is using a version of this touch screen, which Steve Jobs and Wozniak innovated. Um, mm -hmm. and, and before this was, remember the it was Blackberries and uh, yeah, uh, the Crackberry. 
Yeah, and you had you had you 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 needed that, that tactile feel. And remember, people say, "I will never give up my BlackBerry. I will never." I remember. Stop. I need to be able to push a button. My mother, my eighty-year-old mother, types on a screen that is not a screen. So, see, we can innovate. We can evolve. We can uh, get out of our own way. But the first thing you got to do is believe, man. I mean, I'm yeah. not telling you that. I'm telling. I'm saying that. I'm. Uh, I'm saying you had me at hello. We're focused on getting paid, getting rich, not building wealth. Right. We're focused on the transaction, not the relationship. We're focused on me, not about we. Exactly. And, and, and we got to realize, and I put this in my book, The Memo, that real capital comes from the Latin root word capitas, knowledge in the head. Yes. Money, capital has nothing to do with money. We are all capital, but we don't see ourselves that way. We don't treat ourselves that way. In fact, we treat ourselves pretty crappy. <laughs> I agree. So, so, so you mentioned it there. So let's talk about this because you've you've had three books: uh, How the Poor Can Save Capitalism, Love Leadership, which you mentioned earlier, and this new one, The Memo: The, the Five memo. Rules for Economic Liberation. Right. Let, let's are... go. Let's go to that for a moment because because it was very interesting. I mean, it's an interesting title, like The Memo, right? Because you talked to me when we spoke off air. You talked about the first two books. Were, were what what you what you'd learned, and and then you said and and then this one is what you know. So talk know. to us about this because I think this is going to be vital for people to get it. So people who are watching your podcast or listening to this may think he's talking about black people, or he's talking about brown people, or he's talking about poor people. Mm -hmm. No, I'm talking about you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that that even if you're middle class. And you're doing well wherever you are in this world. There's a very good chance that you've got too much month at the end of your money. There's a very good chance that your child's not going to do any better than you're doing. There's a very, very good chance that you're two parents working and you're struggling to make ends meet. And you are feeling resentful of mm -hmm. the 1% because you feel they must have stole it in order to get it because you're working your tail off. you got all these degrees. you got all this, this student loan debt. And you can't figure out why you're not succeeding. The reason you're not succeeding is you never got the memo. There's a memo. The memo. The memo is about how wealth is created, about how money money is generated, how entrepreneurship uh, comes about, how job creation works. Let me be very practical. If I took all the wealth in the world, Dove, and I redistributed it fairly to everybody on the planet, within ten years, the same one percent would end up with all the money. Yeah, book book Mr. Fuller actually demonstrated that. That, and, that and was back in the seventies. So it's you, not changed. That's right. You can go to church every Sunday. You can be the nicest, kindest, most gentle, most sweet, most loving person in the world, which, I, by the way, I encourage you to, to be and to do. And you can still end up dead, dead broke. And the dude down the street who's a crook, criminal, uh, 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 person of ill repute ends up supposedly wealthy. But he's really rich. He, he's not wealthy because he just has money. And you can be an ignorant person with money all day and all night. But but that person, because they understood the mechanisms of how money Work. So going back to 1865, uh, in this country, Abraham Lincoln created a bank, March 3rd, called the Freedmen's Bank. The, the charter of this bank was to teach free slaves about money. So he thought the most important thing he could do after the worst war on our shores, on our, on our land, was to teach free slaves about the free enterprise system. Now, wait a minute. Not to give them an apology for slavery. Not to give them a handout. Not to give them welfare. Not to give them reparations, which they so rightly deserved, right? No, he, he thought the best thing I can do is give them 40 acres and a mule, which is what they did two months before the bank was created, and then to give them the tools and the, the knowledge and the insight to do for themselves. Let me not mm -hmm. give you a fish. Let me teach you how to fish and own the lake, and he was killed the next month. So nobody actually remembers the bank. Nobody knows the bank existed, right? It would be a $100 billion bank today. And so if we're not dumb and we're not stupid, Dub, is what we don't know that we don't know that's killing us. Exactly. But we so if you hang around nine broke people, you'll be the 10th. Absolutely. So, so, so and there's never been a, a riot. We have credit scores in America, right? There's never been a riot in a 700 credit score neighborhood in all of America's history. Whether you're, a, <laughs> I don't care whether there's a black wealthy neighborhood or a white wealthy neighborhood or a Latino, Asian, Indian, whether there's an Indian reservation, there's never been, people with a 700 credit score don't riot, they go shopping, right? All the problems are in a 500 credit score neighborhood. Right. Whether you're white, rural, sure. poor, or you're black, brown, urban, poor, sure. here's what you 
see in your neighborhood? A check casher, next to a payday loan lender, next to a renter owned store, next to a title lender, next to a liquor store, and a church down the street trying to make it all feel a little bit better. Now, I'm going to get relevant now because I, I, I know that people will see this broadcast hopefully several times in different places, but you will, I want your, your, your viewers and watchers to Google search Kanye West and Google search his comments about slavery and how, well, how is it that, that for 400 years we didn't just get up and leave? And it just shows that th this is not about ignorant white people or ignorant, no, it's ignorant everybody, because this was an ignorant black person talking about black people. No, but no, he, said, he said that he, he put it, he, put, he suggested that slavery was a choice. A choice, right. By the way, he is a genius. Let me give him what Kanye West credit. He is a musical, creative genius and a historical idiot because of what, because of his lack of curiosity of facts and because he has not been curious enough to actually go get some. So here's the bottom line. Slavery was an economic system. Yes, absolutely. Period. And they wouldn't got the most genius people in the world, which were in, the, in an agricultural environment, at black Africans who could work in any environment, who could, who could make gold out of soil, brought them here, and we built a country that that is a marvel of the world, and slaves were worth more than railroads in the mid-1800s. They mm -hmm. were worth $4 billion to $1.8 billion. So and slaves were insured. They were financed by banks. They were insured by finance. They were chat chattel property. Now, put that aside for a moment. By the way, none of this I'm saying is racial. This is I'm just telling you, this is an economic system. Economics, now, yeah. The only way you can keep your machinery from walking, walking away from you... <laughs> or taking over your plantation when you're outnumbered a, a, a hundred to one is to break, you got to break their spirit. Yeah. So they would put the, the black dude down who was tw twice as large as his overseer. They'd hold him down and they would abuse his wife in front of him until he broke message. There's nothing you can do about it. And they do that until he had no spirit, no initiative left. Now what's poverty? Poverty has nothing to do with money. Here's the memo. Half of poverty is low self-esteem, and lack of confidence in yourself. So if I don't know who I am by nine in the morning, by dinner time, somebody's gonna tell you who I am, tell me who I am. So it, without confidence, you and I can't do this broadcast. Mm -hmm. you, can't, you can't run your podcast without daily. One thing I noticed about you, the minute that we talked, this guy has confidence. I don't know about your self-esteem, I think you've got good self-esteem, but that's something that's internal to a person. Only you know about your self-esteem. Only I know about my self-esteem. By the way, a dangerous person, High confidence, lots of power, low self-esteem, and fear. That, by the way, resembles... But see, that sounds like somebody who lives in a big white house in Washington. Uh, I didn't say it. You said it. I think it. who it is. I can't, I can't remember where the house is, but I think it was in Washington. I don't know. I don't know. But your viewers and your, your, your listeners can't... See, I love this. It's just a radical movement of common sense. I don't have to name a name. I don't have to point a finger. They can figure it out for themselves. So poverty is low self-esteem and low confidence. Crappy role models in a crappy environment. So if all I see in my neighborhood is, is symbols of success are rap stars, athletes, and drug dealers, why is I anybody surprised that I grew up wanting to be of course, a rap yeah. an athlete or a drug dealer is aspirational and modeling what I see. Environment, you hang around nine broke people, you'll be the 10th. Hope, the most dangerous person in the world is a person with no hope. So here's poverty. Crappy self-esteem and crappy confidence. Crappy role models a crappy environment. No hope, which means the glass is half empty, not half full, which means I never leave my porch. That's why somebody can walk right in your neighborhood who has high self-esteem and high confidence, good role models in a good environment, who's hopeful, sees opportunity everywhere, and buy that, that piece of crap home that's sat next to, to your house for 20 years, buy it, rehab it, and rent it right under your nose. And then we get upset with that person when that person's doing the same thing we could have done. But this is the legacy of slavery. It broke our spirit. It broke our self-esteem. It broke our confidence and our belief in ourself. And now if I don't like me, I'm not going to like you. If I don't feel good about me, I'm not going to feel good about you. If I don't love me, I don't know how to love you. And if I, if I don't have a purpose in my life, I'll make your life a living hell. Now, now we just had a history lesson in four and a half minutes. That everybody watching your broadcast can understand that, irrespective of race. And that's why I'm saying with the best of intentions, leaders are, are walking us off cliffs. Because... You know, I Really, I, I, literally, so, literally, people had PTSD. I mean, I, I, we are our, our, 
our self-esteem and our character had been systemically devastated so we wouldn't put up a fight. That was the whole point. And to not recognize that means that people are wallowing in their own self-aggrandized arrogance. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I see the, the erosion of not only self-worth, um, but I see the erosion of, of belief in the possibility. Like, as a kid, I grew up in the UK and left when I was 20, 21. I've been gone for a lot, hell of a lot longer than I lived there. But I was in love with America when I was a kid. I told my mother at 14 years old, I'm moving there. Because, because it was a place that I saw where anyone could become president, where somebody, where the, the social status that existed in the UK did not exist. The class war was different. And, and I saw people become magnificent who had started out with nothing. And I, my influence to become a speaker was actually Martin Luther King on the day that he died when I was 10 years old. And I saw this man, uh, you know, and now you have to think, put this in context of a 10-year-old white Jewish boy in northern England in a ghetto, walks yeah. in the living room and sees my mom crying. And I, why are you crying? She said, a great man is dead. And I'm looking at the TV like, this guy's not a pop star. He's, he's not a movie star. He's not anybody I know. He's not from TV. Who is he? And then I hear that I have a dream speech and became massively impacted by how a man... In the, in the context of a, a, a young boy, a black man on the other side of the world, you know, in, in my world, uh, on the other side of the world was making my mom, a Jewish poor woman, cry. And I was like, wow, that was, that was, the, that was the seed of me becoming a speaker. I didn't know it at the time, but that was the seed of it. But it was, it was about this willingness to stand up for something and fight for something and become a leader and give a shit, actually care, for me was dramatic. And I remember JFK being assassinated and having similar feelings. You know, yeah. that, that, and I think that this, you know, to come back to where, we're, where, where we need to go to here, is that when I look around at, at the United States, I am, I, I'm political, I speak about political things, and I have a lot of my American friends that will contact me about things that are going on. And, and I say, the sad thing is, that America's forgotten it's American. It's become white, it's become black, it's become Republican, it's become Democratic, it's become something, but it's stopped being American, which is what I was in love with. So, so pause for a minute. So, first of all, the story about your mother and Dr. King is, is, is touching beyond belief. One clarification, Dr. King uh, was dead, he didn't die. He's, he's, he's more alive today than he was back then. Jesus is more alive today than he was when he was killed. So he died, but he's not dead. Because when, you're not, when, you, when you realize you're not a human being having a spiritual experience, you're a spiritual being having a human experience, and you live for something large and more important than yourself, then you say what, what Dr. King said, which is, you can't take my life, but I can freely give it to you. Oh yes. my God! Yeah. If you don't know what you're willing to die for, you aren't fit to live. Exactly. Uh, and so you live, you, you become indicted. It doesn't mean he wasn't afraid of death. Of course he was. But he wasn't afraid, but he was more afraid not to live. And so did your mother, uh, is inspired by the drug dealer who made a lot of money, who lived in Detroit or down the street in the ghetto where you were? No. Was she inspired by even the ball player or the politician that who? for whom nobody remembers, by the way, uh, mm -hmm. or the rich dude that nobody remembers, by the way. No, she was inspired by somebody who was on some level selfless, mm -hmm. who mm -hmm. lived by these higher uh, ideas and these higher values. So I would say America is not dead. I think she is uh, uh, in, in, to, in, in need of a reset uh, and maybe a reboot <laughs> and a software upgrade but in some, way, in some ways, what's going on here, Dove, for two reasons, is actually the most inspiring time in America's history since the world, since uh, the Civil War. Now, on this point that I just said that you should want to cut me off and never let have me as a guest ever again. But I'm going to say that there are two reasons why this is the greatest moment in America's history. Number one, uh, and I'm going to give you a bonus answer. Number one, that only in America can a, a, a flight attendant or a hairdresser go to the gates 
of of the most powerful man in the world in the world and curse him out and and show up at work tomorrow and say, girl, I, his girlfriend said, girl, I saw you on TV last night Trump cursing out the president. Yeah, I cursed him out. I told him exactly the way I felt. Now, now pass me that that pass me those grits. We got to serve lunch. You do that in China, you will disappear. You do that in Russia, you will disappear. You do that in 90% of the world, and you will either disappear or you will be harshly dealt with or ostracized. Only in America and a handful of other places, but we're still the sole superpower in the world. Can you curse out your president on national TV and go to work tomorrow and it's all good? Uh, number two, there's something called a special prosecutor. <laughs> I love this. I love this, right? So there's a special prosecutor who works for the dude, theoretically, that he's prosecuting, who has unlimited power to investigate the dude he's prosecuting. I don't know this in another country. Mm -hmm. I mean, so he's being, so while we're off the tracks and off the rails and things are crazy, it's not like this stuff's not going on unchecked. And the last time this happened in the 70s, the story ended with a measure of justice, mm -hmm. right? Uh, every time the story, there's never been a time, Doug, I want your listeners and viewers to know this, there's never been a time in all of world history where the bad guys actually won. I think that's a, I think that's a vitally important piece because I, you know, it's what we were talking about before. I think that the bad guys do win, but they win the battle, not the war. That's right. Hitler won many battles. But he ultimately ended up uh, taking a poison pill or however he died in some little bunker alone by himself, uh, mm -hmm. his shriveled uh, embodiment of who he, he thought he was. Uh, Osama bin Laden. Hello. Uh, uh, Saddam Hussein. Hello. Uh, ISIS. Uh, hello. I mean, let's Idiot go. Amin. Idiot Amin. We, we can go on forever. Yeah, they'll have their day. But. This world was made for good. We learn bad. This world is defined by light. Darkness has definition because of light. If you are a religious person, and if you are a Christian, you believe in Lucifer, the devil. You then know Lucifer is a fallen angel, which means God gives the punk Lucifer, the devil, permission to exist. Come on now. We're not having church in here, but this, this is actually inspiring stuff, right? That, that, that badness is nothing more than failed goodness that the universe is made for good, that a child born in this world is full of love and they learn hate, racism, discrimination, a bias. We teach adults, so-called adults, <laughs> teach these children how to hate. Okay, quick quick story. I know you don't think I can do a quick story, but I was in- uh, You are yet to convince me. <laughs> I want to do this one really quick and shock you. I was in Jordan with the Crown Prince of uh, Norway and uh, Queen Rania. And I was told not to talk about spirituality, religion, please, John. We got problems in the region. Okay, I said not talking about it is probably part of the problem, but okay, fine. So I'm sitting there. Actually, I didn't say anything. I just listened to him. I'm, I'm, I'm at the front of the mic, and I said, in front of Jordanian TV, about 100 yards from where we are, Jesus Christ was baptized. <laughs> didn't go over very well. Quiet. And I said, but, uh, but 100 yards from there, the prophet Muhammad ascended into heaven. Now, the world's 25 million, 25,000 miles around. What's the chances that would happen within 200 yards of each other? I think the world's trying to teach us something that we're all in this thing together. Anyway, I go in this classroom, young 12-year-old Islam faith girls. What did I mean by this story? Crickets, nothing. Five minutes later, crickets, nothing. They've been told not to talk. After a while, hand goes up. I think you meant that uh, I can be me and allow you to be you. Fantastic. Another hand goes up. The other girl says, 12 years old. I think you meant that uh, religion's like a road. And I can go up the Islam road or the Judaism road or the Christian road or the Hindu road, but we're all trying to get to the same place, the mountaintop, where we all meet with the same maker. I mean, these are 12-year-old kids, man. It's the adults that were the problem, not children. So I'm entirely hopeful, right? And I think that you can build an economy and build jobs and build a solid middle class. When you recognize that it's the middle class and the so-called poor who are driving the entire economy, they don't deserve our pity. They deserve, deserve our support. They don't deserve our. They don't. They don't deserve our narcissistic uh, looking down their noses. They they deserve a Nobel Peace Prize. Uh, a mother of two with one house with, with one income 
who are raising these kids and doing with too much mother in her money deserves an award, deserves an applause, right? And and because of them, the rest of us are doing well. So look, and 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 from them comes the rest of us because we talked about Jim Ke Jim Kelly was I mean UPS was Jim Casey with a hundred bucks and a bicycle. Uh, Coca Cola was a pharmacist with five hundred bucks. Jet Magazine was John uh, John H Johnson with a five dollar five hundred dollar loan from his mother. I was homeless for six months of my life, and people said I would amount to any I would amount to nothing. Right? I'm sure people counted you out. First they will ignore you, then they'll criticize you, then they'll try to copy you, and then you win. I th I. Can't disagree with anything you say. I fully agree with everything you're saying. As we come towards the end of the show, I want to talk to directly to those in leadership positions who are listening, watching the show. What is your most practical piece of guidance that you would like to give to them, John? What is the, the thing that you'd like to say to them to go out and do within the next certainly 24 hours is preference, but five working days in order to embody what it is you've been talking about. Make a decision about, make every decision about culture, not cash. Because if you think about 45 in the, in, uh, President 45 in the White House, and you think about cash, uh, you're going to say, oh, I like my tax breaks, and I like my deregulation, and the economy's doing well, and I want my stocks to go up. So I'm going to put both my principles and my values in my pocket, and I'm going to rationalize all the stuff I don't like and the bullying and all that kind of stuff, because to rationalize is to tell rational lies, or President Bill Clinton once told me, it's hard to get somebody to agree to the truth when the lie is paying their paycheck. But if you say it's about culture, then you say, do I want my grandchild interning at the White House for two weeks? Is that my role model? The answer mm -hmm. is no. Right. I'm sorry, the answer answers itself. Do I want my 18-year-old blonde-haired, blue-eyed daughter, who's attractive, working in the Oval Office alone as an intern for two weeks or over the summer or on a trip over east? Oh, uh, probably not, right? So we start to have different uh, answers when we uh, start talking about our culture and not just our cash. And I think that's the. I think it's not more complicated than that. Is is it's, it's going beyond doing others as you want to be done to yourself. I mean, that's well, that's what the way we should be thinking. It should be Ubuntu. I am me because you are you. But that requires somebody to be high minded and sort of mm -hmm. culturally sensitive and you know high frequency. You know you you know most people most people are pretty basic, right? So they want to know what does this do for me. So I'm, I'm telling you what it does for you. Send your, where would you send your granddaughter? Where would you send your daughter? What kind of values do you want poured into them? What kind of person do you want them to become? And there's your answer. There's your answer. The challenge is, though, that people are morally flaky. Most people have not done enough work on themselves to even have a sense of their own culture. Most people have not dug in to find out what really matters as a truth to them. And by that, I'm not talking a religion at all. I'm just talking about even like the things you just said. Because for most people, the end does justify the means because they're financially struggling. And I think that we, we lose grip on the moral ground as the, middle, as the middle class disappears. Because in the bottom end of that is like, shit, I just got to survive. And in the top end, you know, it's an us or it's an us and them situation. So the morality disappears, the cultural piece disappears, and it becomes a class war. So, and then this is why I think the you know I believe this is why the middle class is more important than ever, Absolutely. is because it's actually where we nail down morality, is where we nail down culture, is where we nail down what we're actually about. And, and at these two ends, you're in, in, at these two ends, and people don't realize this, at these two ends, we're actually in a survival mechanism. Obviously, right. in the bottom end, it's obvious you're a survival because you don't even know if you can eat or bear a pair of shoes or whether you're going to be homeless tomorrow. But at the yeah. top end, because it feels so separated, it's still survival because it can all be gone in a moment. That's and right. so that breeds that, that Gordon Gecko mentality that is yeah. so sad. And, and this, is why, this is why I wanted to have this conversation with you, because I think that this is the piece we've got to get, is if we don't return to building a middle class, I, 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 I don't really think it will crash an economy, 
but it'll crash the culture. And that is probably more important. And we've seen this, uh, you know, you talked about history. I'm a, I'm a student of history too. And we see this when your, a country collapses, it's because of that. That's right. It collapses, it, it collapses from, the, it, from the bottom and, and falls inward, right? Absolutely. It falls inward. It doesn't, doesn't collapse from the top. So, uh, look, you're talking about the whole ball game, and I'm talking about how you win the, the, the series in that ball game. And what I'm suggesting is that morality, to your point, is not enough. I, I, I focus on, on, on self-interest. So what, when, when my accountant calls me today and he says, I'm 53 years old, John, and I've made a lot of money, but I need to know I'm living a good life. I need a legacy. Can I talk to you about that? I know that there's something larger than cash. It's called culture. When, when, I'm, when I'm doing my billionaire and my multimillionaire friends and they're admiring my life, which is a net worth fraction of their life, then I know there's something that's more important than cash, and it's called culture. When I my friends who've got Mercedes and Bentleys and five homes are depressed, distressed, and and uh, and sort of hollowed out inside because they live this whole life, and at the end of it, they don't they feel poor as a person, and they're looking for meaning in their life. And as a result, they want to give away their fortunes, which is fine with me because they're not pouring it into philanthropy. I know that the universe is made for good because now they're taking something bad and actually facilitating something good, which is now hundreds of millions of dollars going, and maybe even billions of dollars going into philanthropy to help the least of these God children to come up to become more enlightened leaders. You know, somebody, um, I'm going to say two things to you I've never said to anybody on any interview. Um, uh, number one is if you ever, if I'm successful at what I'm trying to do, uh, nobody's going to know me as a preacher. I don't want to be the next Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. He's already been a Dr. King. I'm not that good, and, and, I'm, and I'm, a, I'm a sinner. OK, a saint is a sinner that got up. All right. So I'm not Dr. King. I don't want to be a politician. He's already been a black president. I, uh, 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 I'm not trying to be a, a civil rights leader. I'm not, I'm not trying to be Ambassador Andrew Young. I'm not. I'm, I'm me. And who and who am I? I think it's time for a role model entrepreneur. I think it's time for an image of a businessman and an entrepreneur and a philanthropist that made it legal, pays his taxes, did it right, didn't come from entertainment or sports or the arts or gangsterville or whatever, who just got out there, worked his rear end off, was was smart about it, hustled his hustled his tail off, uh, came from nothing, made it made it something, and then gave part of it back in a in in, in his virtuous circle of doing well by doing good, is living a transparent life and living the American dream and making smart sexy again. I think a generation of kids of all races needs to be inspired by that role model image so that they know what, that they can do it too at scale. I think that having a black Bill Gates would have been a hundred times more important than having a black president with no disrespect to our wonderful, dignity rich black president. It has nothing to do with him as a person. I'm just saying the world has changed and now it's about, as you say, aspiration and economics. Number yeah. two, if you ever hear that John Bryant, and by the way, if I'm successful, I'm gonna create billionaires, hundreds of millions and heirs, hundred millionaires, millionaires, and hundred thousand heirs, and then somebody who can afford to buy some air, and those people are going to then go out and become philanthropists and role models in their neighborhood. So it's not just about me; it's about the 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 the, the wave, the, the pebble. You, 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 drop, you, drop, you drop a pebble in the in the ocean, and it creates ripples and waves, and creates a new culture that people then want to emulate. But at the moment, what they have to emulate is a very narrow band of what you call so-called success. Number two, I'm not afraid of death. I don't want to die young. I want to live an old life, a long life, and, and enjoy my family. I want to have kids, the whole thing. I love, love that, but I'm not afraid of death. I'm not afraid of it. I made peace with it. So if ever you hear that I've been taken out, <laughs> it's not going to be the Klan, the Ku Klux Klan. It's not going to be the white industrial, the industrialist. It's not going to be the black bourgeoisie. It's not going to be anybody you and I know. It's going to be drug dealers. <laughs> mm -hmm. They're going to catch me in an alley one day, and they're going to say, you know what, John? You know, we've been listening to your tapes and watching you on Facebook Live and watching you on the Dub Baron International podcast. And, you know, you inspire me, man. You know what I'm saying? I, I, I even want my kids to listen to you. And I want my kids to do exactly what you're saying. But you you, you heard my business. Right. All, my, all my customers talking about hope and shit. <laughs> all, all, I got no employees. They're talking about going to school and shit. People talking about becoming entrepreneurs and trying to be self-made, trying to be legal. You messing with my business. My business requires depression. My business model requires hopelessness. My business model requires requires addiction. You mess with my business, you gotta go. Yeah. That's, a, that's the greatest compliment they could give me because you can't take my life, but I can freely offer it up. Yeah, that is to, brilliant. And so, and so I think we've gotta, we, we gotta realize that, that there is no, 
There is no second take. There is no replay of this life. We are older now than when we started this broadcast. What are you doing, listeners, viewers, with your time? How are you investing your time? You're getting older as we sit here. There is no time to waste. Talk without being offensive. Listen without being defensive. And always leave even your adversary with their dignity. Because if they don't, if you don't, you spend the, they'll spend the rest of their life trying to make you miserable. And what have you gotten from that? Because, because pain creates more pain and hurt people hurt people. So let's get out of the hurting game. Let's get out of the pain game. Let's get in the love game. And let's lift somebody up because when you lift, you rise too. Yeah. You can't lift somebody up unless you're rising at the same time, right? And so there's your legacy. There's your purpose of living. And then we're going to prove you can do well and do good, though. You do well by doing good. Many have done And those are the best and most enlightened examples right. of societal transformation. And so I just believe that uh, people don't want the life they've got right now. I think they're existing and they're surviving. They're not thriving. They're not living. And they know it. And I agree with you. And I want to tell you a quick story as we finish up. And that is um, because I, I, the sad thing is that we also have to face the fact that there are people who will... You are going to, even if you decide to do well and do good, you are going to face resistance and you need to acknowledge that you're going to face resistance. Um, you know, I can tell a couple of stories about standing and, and standing in a ghetto in Detroit talking to an all black audience and being the only white guy in the room and saying, why the hell would you listen to this cracker? Um, yeah. And I said, no. because I'm you. I, and I know that, no. the, I know there was no. a bunch no. of people who gave you grief about coming here because you wanted to do better. And the, the, the misery does love company and you've got to decide to do something else. But I, but I said to them, at the other end of that, you need to know this, that a man walked into my office who was recommended to me and, we, and he had paid for an hour in advance. And it's not cheap to get an hour with me. And he paid for an hour in advance and at 40 minutes I said, we're done now. And he says, I paid for an hour. And I said, yeah, we're done. And he said, why? I said, because we're not going to work together. And he said, why not? I said, because you can't afford me. And he said, do you know how much money I have? I said, actually, I do. I realize that if you're not a billionaire, you're damn close. I know where you live. I know the, how, the car you drive. And I went about describing his environment, which I'd never seen, but I knew. And he said, well, how can you say I can't afford you? I said, because you don't know the, you know the price of everything and you don't know the value of anything. And, and for me, the work that I do is about being a purpose-driven leader. And purpose is about what you, what you soulfully hold close, not what you hold in your bank account. And, and as long as you're fixated on that, you're gonna, everybody around you is going to be kissing your ass because of money. But you're, it's all a soulless journey. And until we come back to that, we're all lost. And I think that that is an important point. And I want to thank you, John, for everything you brought to us about that today. We're, we're, uh, please tell our listeners, our viewers, where they can find out more about you, about your books, about all the programs that you have, all the resources that you offer. We'd love for them to be able to tap into that. Yeah, first of all, uh, thank you, Dove. And, and I really enjoyed this. I know why you're so successful. You're, you're, thank you, you, sir. You everything you got in every interview. Uh, you, you're all in. You're not half pregnant. You, you, you give birth every time to a new reality. And that's a beautiful thing, right? How do you get mad at somebody who's giving everything they, they have? You got to love that person. You got to respect that person. So you are actually you. not a white man. You're an honorary black man. And so that's the honor I'm giving you today. Well, uh, I, I will definitely take that. Thank you so much. And my <laughs> wife will be very pleased to hear it because she's saying I'm always trying to claim that I'm not white. Yeah. Hey, look, hey, look. By the way, uh, based according to our DNA, most people, most white people have black blood in them, and most black people have white blood in them. Which is white race so absolutely ridiculous because that means I hate if I hate white people, I hate myself. And all, but anyway, so so Operation Hope. So people know me from Operation Hope. That's I think what attracted you to part of my message, and I'm honored by that. Uh, but I've created 40 different entities, uh, two thirds of which are nonprofit, a third of which are for profit. So I run the largest nonprofit financial inclusion organization, Operation Hope, two and a half billion dollars invested in underserved neighborhoods, uh, 35,000 volunteers, 4,000 schools, opening an office every two weeks. So you can go to operationhope.org. All services are free. And we raise credit scores 120 points in 24 months because nothing changes your life more than God or love than moving your credit score 120 points. We'll become the Starbucks of financial inclusion. Uh, we will finish what Abraham Lincoln started with the Freedmen's Bank and Frederick Douglass. 
We renamed the cause of the renaming of the Treasury Annex building to the Freedmen's Bank building, the only American citizen ever to rename a White House building on the White House campus. And we've only just begun. Then I'm also CEO of the Promise Homes Company, which is the largest minority controlled owner of single family rental real estate in the country. And we're, we're growing that now to uh, hopefully a billion dollar company in about three years. Uh, and we started that last year. It's already uh, north of $30 million. So we're these are my two, $130 million worth of capital on that one. Well, those are my two major platforms. Then we have Global Dignity and and all, and all the other stuff we're doing and Just Brothers. And I have my books that you've mentioned. The, the book, The Memo, is uh, the book, the memo is a culmination of, of what I absolutely know will, will rock your viewers and listeners' consciousness about what they think they know about how the world works. Because what they think they know is actually, with all due respect, wrong. You have idiots and fools running countries and companies. And brilliant people who are homeless, precisely because it's not just about how smart you are, mm -hmm. right? Uh, and so you got to understand this game. You have to understand how it works. You have to understand free enterprise system, about capitalism, about ownership. Don't just get a job. Maybe create a job. Uh, don't just tell your children to, 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 to go work for somebody. Maybe, maybe encourage your, your child to create a job for somebody. Uh, don't limit the, their potential. Tell them that you love them every day of their life because nothing's more important and what my mother told me growing up, Peter Smith, John Hope Bryant, I love you. John Bryant, I love you. You can do anything you want to do. And I believed it. I believed it. I believed it. And I saw my dad as a businessman, and so I wanted to be one too. It's not more complicated than that. No. I just said, yes, I am, and yes, I can, right? And now I decided what I was going to do, and that's what I'm. That's why I'm here with you. And I just hope that some of the passion and, and energy that we poured in uh, to this uh, podcast and broadcast will seep into the souls and the ether and the vibes and the energy and the futures and the enthusiasm of the people who are watching this and listening to this who just need it a little nudge. Thank you. What is the what is the website they should go to to find out more? So johnhopebryant.com, if you just sort of don't know where to go, operationhope.org. And go to Facebook at John Hope Bryant Live where we have 60 million video views. They are all free. Of uh, my content, uh, and uh, we will rebroadcast re re this once you once you put it out. Fabulous. Well, thank you, my man. It has been an honor and a pleasure. Thank you so much for everything that you've shared, for the guidance, and uh, it's been a, an amazing conversation. Thank you so much, and I hope you'll stay with us to the end. And to you, dear viewer, dear listener, remember the research consistently shows that one of the biggest challenges facing even the most successful companies is somewhat counterintuitive in that these fast-growing companies often hit a point where they realize they're spending a fortune attracting, training, and developing talent only to have them leave them at an alarming rate. If you're sick of investing in the training and developing of talent only to have them leave you before you get your ROI, then come talk to us at fullmontyleadership.com where we provide the essential leadership skills to rekindle and amplify the hidden loyalty assets inside of your organization by tapping into purpose. fullmontyleadership.com providing you with the concrete soft skills to get you and your organization to the top and keep you there. Why? Because you can't outsource authenticity. Remember to also stop by the matrix, matrix.fullmontyleadership.com. You don't need triple W dot, just matrix like the movie dot fullmontyleadership.com and get your authentic leadership matrix self-assessment tool. All right, and remember, check us out on, on uh, Alexa and on Google. Just say play Dove Baron podcast. Till next time, this is Dove Baron saying stay curious my friend stay curious about how you can do good while doing well it's important i'm dov baron i'm here to assist you tapping into your deep greatness to reach the next level of clarity focus purpose and profit in your business your life and your leadership and your impact so next time i am out <laughs>